Chapter 1 What a way for her son to start the second month of seventh grade. Penelope studied herself in the tall gold mirror propped in her bedroom. She dressed professionally, a bohemian style midi dress and strappy sandals because she planned to head to work after seeing to Evan. She suspected he had strep throat. Again! What 12-year-old boy got strep throat every other week? She'd been surprised the previous evening when he hadn't finished the chocolate ice cream she'd brought to soothe his throat. She'd finished it instead because she couldn't let the ice cream go to waste. She'd used a clean spoon, assuring herself that whatever virus he had wasn't contagious. I'm not sick, Mom. Everyone gets sore throats. Evan stood in the living room of their 18th century Victorian home, wearing his customary saggy jeans. He shrugged on his black leather jacket and crossed his chubby arms. His cheeks shone a bright red, a sprinkling of freckles across his nose. His stout build reminded Penelope of herself, though his legs were too long for his body, a promise if her ex's height was any indication, of the tall man Evan would someday become. Her thoughts swerved to Jacob and his muscular, sturdy physique. She scolded herself to stop thinking about him, yet he remained in her thoughts. He was a curve in the road, a curve in her life she could ill afford. She didn't know why she told him so much about herself. Did you hear me, Mom? Her son interrupted her musings. The humidity of a southern October afternoon should have deterred him from wearing a jacket. And what was it about dark colors these days? A kind of rebellion, she supposed. She kept her opinions to herself. No use fighting over small battles like a black jacket. She placed her hand on his warm forehead. You have a fever. He pulled back as if she'd branded him with her touch. Where had her apple-cheeked, angelic son gone? Once Evan hit 12 years old, he turned into a mini monster. Are you driving me to the doctor's office? He asked. Did he try to avoid being seen with her? Or was this all her imagination? He sure didn't act like a kid who wanted to go places with his mother. We can't walk from the outskirts of town. Besides, my throat is sore too. You made two appointments, he groaned. We'll be there forever. Just one. I'm hoping the doctor will recommend an over-the-counter medicine for me. I'll ask him for you. Evan jutted out his chin in defiance. Then I can go by myself. Dr. Williams's office is past the Roses Recreation Center. She vacillated, remembering the numerous swim meets Evan had once participated in. So? You used to love to swim. Happy memories flooded her thoughts. The coach said you were natural at the butterfly stroke. I guess the butterflies flew away, Evan muttered. Swimming is a lifelong sport. Exercise builds endurance and will keep you healthy and slim. That last bit slipped out, and her son frowned. She hadn't meant any inference to his weight gain over the past year. I like ocean swimming, he said. The rec center's indoor pool is too closed in. She wondered how their conversation had gone from strep throat to swimming. But a dialogue, any dialogue with Evan, was welcome. We never live near the ocean, but we'll visit during the summer. A thought came to mind, overseeing the Hilton Head Toy Headquarters instead of the Shop and Roses. Commuting, if she was needed in the office. I'll homeschool you next semester, and we can live on Uncle Lincoln's houseboat. How will I be able to spend spring break with Dad and Victoria? Your stepmother will be absorbed with the newborn baby, and I'm sure your father and I can work out a congenial solution 
Oh, right. Like that would ever happen. A solution might be possible if her ex was even remotely agreeable and they didn't get into an argument whenever they discussed custody. Only Roy would move clear to another state to please his young wife, forsaking the needs of his son. A houseboat in a harbor is a fishbowl like living here, Evan said. Well, we can rent a cottage farther out. How about Defusky? The island is only a short ferry ride from Hilton Head's mainland and surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, great, then everyone in school will call me a freak. She sighed. There was no pleasing Evan, though she tried and tried. You're a freak for living on a houseboat? For being homeschooled, Mom. She faltered. Have your classmates called you a freak before? Try every day, Mom. I just want to swim where no one is staring at me, especially my teammates from the swim team. Why on earth would they stare at you? Because I'm fat and ugly and a slow swimmer? That's ridiculous. Don't say it's not true, because we both know it is. The popular kids don't want anything to do with me. His shoulders hunched, yet his gaze was astute. You competed in championship competitions. Uncle Lincoln showed me the newspaper clipping when you won first place in freestyle. Perseverance pays off. You always say swimming is a lifetime sport, but you never swim anymore. That was her life eons ago, before her college years, her failed marriage. In high school, she'd immersed herself in competitions. Everything had changed after her marriage. But not at first. Blissful happiness came first. And then she'd begun to suspect her husband was unfaithful, although Roy had denied her suspicions. If she ignored the signs, perhaps his affair would go away, she told herself. It hadn't. Since the betrayal, heartbreak, and subsequent divorce, she'd fortified herself with a barricade. She was serene and no-nonsense. In her youth, she'd been known for her sense of humor, but hardly anything made her laugh anymore. She breathed in. Nothing was going to topple her hard-earned and sensible equilibrium. She recalled the camaraderie with her teammates and the late-night swim meets. She loved belonging to a tight-knit group of friends she relied on. Was Evan missing out on those same memories because he'd abruptly quit the team? Why hadn't she realized his withdrawal from all extracurricular activities since her divorce and their move to Rose's? The signs were clearly there if she'd only taken the time to notice. You're a bad mom, her conscience reprimanded. I try my best. Still, she should have encouraged him more. Instead, she'd become more involved in the business and neglected her son in the bargain. She took in Evan's appearance, sandy brown hair and vivid blue eyes, and her heart squeezed. His heavy set build would thin out as he grew, and his resemblance to her good-looking brother, Lincoln, was striking. Some day, Evan would become a young man with more girlfriends than he could count. He wasn't aware of that yet and didn't care. He was interested in the present. She prided herself on identifying issues at the toy shop and fixing them. Now she needed to focus on her vulnerable son and fix whatever was causing his problems. She hoped she wasn't too late. Make sure your hamster's cage is secure, she said. Yesterday, he got out and ran all over the house. Giblet is a girl, Mom, Evan replied. Besides, I want a puppy. Let's see how well you care for your hamster first. Last week, I rescued her from behind a shelf where she got stuck. Evan obeyed while muttering under his breath for having to do chores when he was sick. 
and they walked out the front door. Won't you be late for work, he asked. Are you still trying to get rid of me? He stooped to pick up a loose stone and sent it hurtling across the lawn. Maybe. It hurts when you speak to me like that. Sorry, Mom, he muttered. I phoned Uncle Lincoln and told him to expect me by mid-morning. Penelope kept her voice calm. He and the staff can easily handle my absence. Besides, I make my own hours. Penelope and Lincoln shared ownership of New Beginnings Toys, a well-known toy company noted for producing heirloom wooden rocking horses and organic toys. In addition to the Rosa's shop and headquarters on Hilton Head, the business distributed toys across the United States. Her flight to Virginia had been to finalize the acquisition of another property for expansion. Since the plane trip, she'd pushed aside her confession to Jacob that she hated her job. Just keep on living and working in a no longer challenging career was her motto. She led an isolated life, the fate of soon turning 50, and had come to accept the sad truth. As a pastime, she'd begun making wooden dolls that children seemed to love, but the craft, though easy and enjoyable, was time-consuming. I'll be late for school, Evan said. All this concern about lateness, you don't even like school, she said. Throughout his elementary days, Evan had aced classes and scored straight-A report cards. The past couple of years, his grades had slipped. He had no friends, at least none who came over to their house anymore. He stayed in his room, munching on bags of potato chips, and played video games for hours. Her once athletic son. I'll get behind in school if I don't go, he protested. A last-ditch effort, she supposed. You'll catch up. This is the only appointment available with a new doctor in town. Emphasis on the word new. Everyone is raving about how gentle and patient he is. The mothers at your school say he's excellent with kids and he won't rush us. He'll answer all our questions. You mean my questions, Mom, not our. The appointment is mine. I'm not a kid anymore. True. He was turning into an adolescent, and she doubted she could live through the next few years. Why aren't we seeing Dr. Damien? Evan asked as he slipped into the front seat of their truck and buckled his seatbelt. I'm used to him. For one thing, Uncle Lincoln and I remember Dr. Damien treating us, which goes back decades. For another, Dr. Damien has thankfully retired. I was beginning to question whether he was thorough enough. I liked him. I was comfortable with him, too. However, I assume Dr. Williams is up on the latest medical techniques. Aunt Shanice said he's good-looking. Shanice was Lincoln's wife. They'd been wed a few years and still displayed a delightful newlywed affection for each other. Penelope grinned. She'd heard an earful about the handsome Dr. Williams, but romance was the last thing on her mind. He was probably fresh out of medical school, married, with a couple of kids. When she found a spot in the crowded parking lot, she parked a distance from the entrance, declaring the walk was beneficial for both her and Evan. Once they stepped into the office, the receptionist, clearly flustered, greeted them with a distracted hello and ushered them to a packed waiting room. We're behind at least 45 minutes, she explained. Dr. Williams was called in for an emergency at the free clinic he established in town. He's returned and is seeing patients, and we apologize for the delay. Considering the time, Penelope surmised that Dr. Williams kept early hours. Unlike her, she was the opposite of a morning person. She'd read about the clinic He'd secured a donated warehouse facility near the hospital and solicited donations from businesses and additional funding through a state grant. He provided free health care to patients who couldn't afford otherwise. Open on weekdays and weekends, the word was spreading and evening hours were being extended. 
After filling their paperwork, the nurse called Evan's name. Penelope stood, and Evan stuffed his hands into his pockets. Much to Evan's frowning dismay, she followed him into the examining room. She pointed to her throat, her excuse, to accompany him. You'll get the swab done and tested, and we'll leave with a prescription for your antibiotics in hand, she assured. Couldn't be easier.